Reykjavik is a great city, but for a lot of people, what they really want to do in Iceland is get out into the countryside. And fortunately, some of the most beautiful parts of Iceland are a short drive from downtown Reykjavik. So I want to go through, I would say, the four most popular day trips from Reykjavik, the things that you might be able to fit in even if you're only in town for a day or two. Uh, these are the ones that you'll be choosing from if you're going to have two or three days to spend. Just to give you your bearings, Reykjavik is right here. The Blue Lagoon, the famous spa, is right by the airport, about 45 minutes away. The Golden Circle is a countryside drive to the east of Reykjavik. The south coast is about an hour and a half southeast of Reykjavik. There's some great sites in this area. And the last one I'll talk about is a little less known, but I think it's great, the Westman Islands, which are just offshore from the south coast. So I'm going to go through each one of those so you can kind of consider your options depending on how much time you have. For a lot of people, maybe one of the main reasons they go to Iceland is to go to the Blue Lagoon. This is this very famous, beautiful thermal spa. Water's about 100 degrees. You're surrounded by volcanic rock. Some, in some cases, the, there's actually steam vents coming out of the volcanic rock. Because of the unique mineral composition of the water, it's got kind of a blue sheen. That's where it gets its name. Uh, I'm not here to tell you not to go to the Blue Lagoon. I love the Blue Lagoon. I think it's great. But I think it's good to know a little bit more about it and make an informed decision. The reason for that is it's expensive. Uh, a ticket to the Blue Lagoon starts at about $100 per person. If you go early in the day or later in the day, you might get an $80 ticket or even a $70 ticket. But plan on spending about $100 per person. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the experience and you can make the decision for yourself. Uh, Icelanders think the Blue Lagoon is kind of a strange phenomenon. Most Icelanders wouldn't go here. First of all, they never pay that much. Uh, they see it as kind of a tourist trap. They also think it's kind of funny because the Blue Lagoon started as sort of excess water from a geothermal plant, okay? They built this plant here on the background. They realized, so they dug holes into the ground, they pulled up this water. They realized they couldn't use the water as it was, but they could use that water to heat other water, fresher water, purer water, that they could then send into communities for drinking water. But then they had to do something with all the extra water that they just extracted this heat from. It was still pretty hot. So they would just dump it in the lava plain next to the plant. And suddenly people started showing up in the middle of nowhere and swimming in this really warm, beautiful water. And someone had the great idea, let's turn this into a tourist attraction. And now it's the most, tourist <laughs> most popular tourist attraction in Iceland. Don't be grossed out by this. It's all natural water. It was just used to heat other water. It wasn't processed in any way. Um, but just be aware that that's sort of the history of it. Uh, the Blue Lagoon is just a fun experience to bob around and enjoy swimming. You can see there's kind of a white film that builds up on the rocks of the Blue Lagoon. And you can swim up to this stand in the Blue Lagoon and they'll give you some white goop that you put on your face. And it's supposed to have uh, sort of exfoliant properties. I, I don't know if it really works, but <laughs> when you're in Iceland, you've got to try putting the stuff on your face. Um, one interesting thing about the Blue Lagoon logistically is it's close to the airport. So the main international airport where you're arriving in Iceland is about 45 minutes from Reykjavik. The Blue Lagoon is about 10 minutes from that airport. So here's a really good tip for efficient sightseeing. If you're arriving early in the day, go straight to the Blue Lagoon, enjoy it there, and then continue from there on into Reykjavik. Uh, if you're flying out late in the day, you could do the opposite. You could leave Reykjavik midday, go to the Blue Lagoon, have an afternoon there, and then board your late flight. And that would be the most relaxed flight you'll probably ever have coming straight from the Blue Lagoon. So just be aware of that logistical uh, part of it. The other thing you really need to know about the Blue Lagoon, it requires reservations. And it can book up the best slots, the most desirable slots can book up a couple weeks ahead even or longer in peak season. So if you're going to go to the Blue Lagoon, and especially if you're trying to coordinate it with your flight time, be sure to get your booking ahead of time. It's very unlikely you'll be able to get in if you don't have an advance reservation. I mentioned earlier that Icelanders are a little skeptical about the Blue Lagoon, partly because of the expense. Uh, the reason why is, be aware, the Blue Lagoon is sort of the ultimate example of the Icelandic thermal bathing culture, but it's not the only example. There are about a dozen municipal swimming pools around Reykjavik that have water just as hot as the Blue Lagoon, and a ticket costs one-tenth as much. Now, you might look at this and say, why would I go to a municipal swimming pool in Iceland? What you might not realize is the water in the main pool is about 85 degrees. And the water in the smaller pools is about 100 degrees. So it's not just a normal swimming pool. And it's all naturally heated water that comes straight from underneath the earth. This is also a very Icelandic experience. As I mentioned, if you're in Iceland for just a few days, you might find you're on a tourist trail and you don't really break out of that and have a truly Icelandic experience. If you go to a suburban Reykjavik thermal swimming pool, that is an Icelandic experience. In Great Britain, at the end of a busy day of work, people gather their families and they go down to the pub, right? In Spain and Italy, at the end of a long day's work, people take their families wandering through the streets, the Paseo in Spain, the Pastajata in Italy. If there's a 
Comparable situation to that in Iceland, it's that at the end of a school day or a work day, people gather their kids and take them down to the thermal swimming pool. So if you go to one of these, you'll be surrounded by 90% Icelanders. If you go to the Blue Lagoon, you'll be surrounded by 99% tourists. <laughs> Doing both is a great option. Uh, and in fact, I become sort of a hot water aficionado when I'm in Iceland. It's not just Reykjavik. You see these signs all over the country in Iceland. I, I think every community with at least 100 people has somehow scraped together the resources to have a really top-notch municipal thermal swimming pool heated by natural thermal water. So if you're driving around Iceland and you're getting worn out and tired, look for one of these signs, stop in. There's a very specific procedure for how you're supposed to come and go. It sounds intimidating, but it's really not if you know the rules. And in the Rick Steves Iceland guidebook, we have detailed instructions for how to do these thermal swimming pools. There's also a variety of other, they call them premium thermal baths. So you've got the municipal swimming pool, which is about 10 bucks a person. You've got the Blue Lagoon, which is 100 bucks a person. And then there's four or five of these premium thermal baths that are more like 40 or $50 a person that are a little more catering to tourists, but are not as inaccessible to locals. And they're a nice compromise. I'll talk about a few of those as we go through the destinations. There are also some places you can go out in nature and be in thermal waters. This is a little bit riskier. You have to really know what you're doing and make sure you don't accidentally get into a pool that's too hot. Um, but if you have a good guidebook and get good information from locals, be aware that there's opportunities to get in hot water all over Iceland. <laughs> so we've talked about the Blue Lagoon, the second um, very popular day trip itinerary. I would say the most popular day trip itinerary is the Golden Circle. The Golden Circle is about a 150 mile loop drive going from Reykjavik into the Icelandic interior, connecting three major sites and lots of other smaller sites if you choose along the way. I would say if there's any one kind of must-do site, the quintessential Icelandic day trip, it would be the Golden Circle. I happen to like the South Coast, which we'll talk about next. I would say they're, to me, equally appealing for different reasons. Let me tell you what you would do on the Golden Circle if you decide to do this. This is 150 miles. It takes about a day. If you're in a hurry, you could do it in six, seven hours. If you want to linger and have a meal along the way, it could be eight, nine, ten hours, just to give you a sense. The first of the three main stops on the Golden Circle is this place. Now let's remember our Icelandic language lessons. The big P with a stick on the top is the TH sound, and the two L's are a TL sound. So this is pronounced Thingvetlir. Thingvetlir. It's often spelled in English with the TH, but it's not Thingvelir, it's Thingvetlir, just to get you a, a little bit of a sense of the Icelandic language. Um, Thingvetlir is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about the geology of Iceland. Uh, we've talked about how Iceland's kind of in the middle of nowhere between Europe and North America. However, it happens to sit right along the Mid-Atlantic Fault, which is technically the biggest mountain range in the world that just happens to be under the Atlantic Ocean. This is where the North American and the Eurasian tectonic plates are pulling apart. And this is the reason why Iceland is so volcanically active. The fault between those two tectonic plates uh, actually cuts right up through the middle of Iceland. So anytime you talk about volcanoes or thermal springs in Iceland, you're talking about something that's along this red line. Thingvetlir is right here, for example. So one reason people like to go to Thingvetlir is there's places where you can walk through chasms where you have the impression that you're literally walking between continents. It's a little more complicated than that, but essentially one side of this picture is North America, the other side of this picture is Europe. Uh, so for geological reasons, Thingvetlir is very popular. It's also very popular for historical reasons. This is a very important place for the Icelanders because where this flag is, right here on this rock, is where starting in the year 930, the Icelanders had a great assembly. So all the chieftains of all these widely scattered farms all over the uh, desolate country of Iceland would come together once a year, have a big meeting, make important decisions about the future of their, of their humble little country. Uh, it's called the All Thing, the All Thing Gathering. Uh, for that reason, Thingvetlir is a very important national park and is sort of kind of the constitution hall for Icelanders. They consider it kind of the birthplace of their civilization. So if you're interested in the history of Iceland, that's another reason why this Thingvetlir is great. Now we're going to continue along the Golden Circle. And by the way, I want to say it's not just the three big stops. It's all of the beautiful countryside you see in between. What's really remarkable about traveling in Iceland is you could be a half hour outside of Reykjavik and you're in a landscape that looks like no human being has ever been there before. Um, and the Golden Circle is a great chance to get out and really experience the Icelandic countryside. Uh, at one point, you're driving along a pipeline that's bringing superheated natural water from the plants out in the distant countryside all the way into downtown Reykjavik to come out of people's taps. So this gives you a sense of Iceland beyond the capital. Uh, and as you travel around, you'll stop off at a beautiful little lakefront. And here's another little geothermal plant just sort of hissing away. You'll see that all over the Icelandic countryside. 
The second big stop of the Golden Circle is a place called Gezir, and this is where uh, English and other languages got the word geyser. Uh, but this was the original word in Icelandic to describe this sort of steaming, bubbling plain where you have a lot of hot water spurting around. And if you're at the plain in Gezir, you'll look over and you see a bunch of people standing in a big circle looking at a big hole that's kind of <laughs> bubbling up. So you say there must be something about to happen. So you wait and get your camera ready. And sure enough, after about 10 minutes, it starts to bubble and boil and the geyser shoots off. Now let me warn you, old faithful this ain't. It's not exactly every 10 minutes. It's about every 10 minutes. Here's another tip. Don't blink. Okay, the geyser doesn't last for very long. Have your camera ready. Make sure it didn't go to sleep while you were waiting, because otherwise you're waiting another 10 minutes for the next one. Uh, I would say geyser is not the main attraction. It's right on the way to some other sites. It's fun to stop off for, for 20 or 30 minutes and go for a walk and, and get a sense of this aspect of the Icelandic countryside. Uh, one of the stops I think that really is a highlight on the Golden Circle is the third major stop, and it's this waterfall, Gutlfoss. Gutlfoss. And I would say there are three great waterfalls, my favorite three waterfalls in Iceland. This is the first one, Gutlfoss. And as you can see from the parking lot, you walk down a trail, and you find yourself really immersed in this amazing landscape of a thundering waterfall. You feel the mist uh, coming up out of this gorge and hitting you in the face. Uh, really a dramatic waterfall experience. There are lots of other minor uh, attractions also on the Golden Circle. So if you have a little bit more time, you can stop off and have a meal. You can stop off at a place like this. It's called Kevith. It's a crater where you can get out of your car and walk around the lip of this really colorful crater. And there are also several thermal bathing opportunities as well on the Golden Circle. So in our Rick Steves Iceland guidebook, we've outlined four convenient thermal bathing opportunities you can fit into your Golden Circle trip if you have a little bit of extra time. Okay, so that's the second of the two of the four major day trips, Blue Lagoon, Golden Circle. Now we're going to head down to the south coast. The south coast is about an hour and a half to two hour drive from downtown Reykjavik. The reason you go to the south coast is for really dramatic natural scenery, obviously coastal scenery. And this is also a place with a lot of volcanic activity and a chance to look at some glaciers. Um, the reason you would do this instead of the Golden Circle is if you want to see the seashore, if you want to go for some hikes, there's a few more hiking opportunities along the south coast. It has an almost sort of Celtic look to it. It has these kind of rugged green rolling hills and mountains. Uh, it also has my second favorite uh, waterfall in Iceland. This one's called Seljalandsfoss. It's a beautiful waterfall to look at, but it's also fun because there's a trail that leads all the way behind the waterfall. Take my word for it. You want to wear waterproof shoes and a waterproof jacket because you will be soaked by the time you're done with it. But it is really delightful to walk around behind this stunning, thundering waterfall. Another highlight for people visiting the south coast is this glacier, Solheima Jokutl. Jokutl is the word for glacier, so anytime you see Jokutl in Icelandic, that means glacier. Uh, and this is the easiest one closest to Reykjavik where you can actually go for a little hike and actually, depending on conditions, walk up and touch the glacier, or at least see it from a distance. Nearby, you can go to Reynesfjara, which is a beautiful black sand volcanic beach, which has some beautiful basalt formations. Do you remember I showed you the church in Reykjavik that had kind of this jagged skyline? This is a basalt formation that you see all over the country. That's what he's sort of trying to evoke with that. The other reason why the south coast is well known is this is the location of the notorious volcano that went off in 2010 and halted air travel throughout Europe because of all the ash that it threw up into the atmosphere. This is a tough Icelandic word, Eja Fjata Jokotl. Eja Fjata Jokotl. Some people call it E15, E and 15 letters because it's too hard to say. Eja Fjata Jokotl. This is one of many volcanoes along the south coast. Um, usually they're dormant, but every few years one of them does erupt. You're not going to see anything from Eja Fjata Jokotl except you're going to faintly see this sort of glacier-covered uh, mountain off in the distance as you drive. But notice, this is this red line that shows where the two tectonic plates are pulling apart. We're talking about this area right here. So anywhere you have volcanoes, it's going to be on this red line running through the middle of Iceland. If you're interested in volcanoes, there's an interesting site uh, along the south coast in a little town called the Lava Center, a very new modern exhibit where you can learn more about the history and the landscape that was shaped by Iceland's volcanoes. Okay, our last of the four key day trips from Reykjavik is in some ways my sentimental favorite. It's the classic backdoor. If you know Rick Steves, we love to talk about backdoors. But the idea of a backdoor is it's a small, lesser known, less touristed alternative to the big popular touristy destinations. For me, that is the Westman Islands. 
It's a little chain of islands, just a 40-minute boat ride from the south coast or an easy 40-minute flight from downtown Reykjavik. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Westman Islands. I love it because it's a beautiful landscape. It's certainly Iceland, but it feels different from what you're going to find on the mainland. Uh, it's less touristed partly because it's tricky to reach. We have all of the details in our Rick Steves Iceland guidebook, but basically you can take a boat from the south coast or you can fly from Reykjavik. Both options are somewhat weather dependent. So especially outside of summer, you might plan your day to go to the Westman Islands and discover the boat's not running today. So just be prepared for that. For that reason, I would recommend, if you've got a few days, spend a couple of nights on the south coast. And then as the trip approaches, and you can look at weather forecasts, if one of the days looks better than the other, that's the day you go to the Westman Islands. And if it's canceled on the other day, you can still see the sights around the south coast. It's a very flexible itinerary suggestion. Why would you go to the Westman Islands? Well, first of all, it's really just one main inhabited island that you're going to. Uh, and it's a charming little rustic town with a dramatic setting. It's a very popular fishing port. And there's all these dramatic cliffs where they teach young kids to crawl up and harvest seabird eggs. There's a really specific culture in the Westman Islands of, of training kids to free climb rock faces to harvest seabird eggs. The main reason people are interested in Westman Islands is because it was the site of a very famous volcano, 1973. Late at night, one January, all of a sudden, uh, all of the natives were woken up by the eruption of a gigantic volcano just over their heads. Fortunately, everybody was able to be evacuated, but the world watched over the next few weeks as the lava flow very slowly encroached on the town. It actually ended up swallowing up parts of the town. It even threatened briefly to seal off this perfect natural harbor. Fortunately, it stopped just shy of that. If you're interested in volcanoes in Iceland, this is a fascinating place to go. You can actually see some of the houses that are partly swallowed up by the lava from the 1973 eruption. And there's a really beautiful state-of-the-art museum that they've actually built around one of those houses. And it tells you the whole story of that eruption. If you are interested in volcanoes, I would say this might be the best site in Iceland, other than if you happen to see an eruption while you're there, which is not that likely. Um, and if you leave that museum and hike up on the bluff over town, you're kind of strolling, and it's just sort of a typical Icelandic rocky bluff. And suddenly you start to realize that there are street signs, and it's marking where the streets of that town one generation ago were, now 50 feet below you <laughs> under this wall of lava that froze up during that 1973 eruption. It's really an, an amazing place. You can even hike up to the volcano itself. It's mostly dormant now. It's not hot, but it's still warm up at the top. So it's kind of interesting to, to, to really have an experience like that. Uh, if I'm on the Westman Islands, I like to get out a little bit into the countryside. You can either take your car on the ferry, or you can hire, uh, there's a, a great company that does day tours on the Westman Islands, and they'll drive you around. You can drive from one end to the other in 15 minutes. One reason people like to get out into the countryside on the uh, Westman Islands is the great puffin populations. If you've been to Iceland, you know the puffin is sort of the unofficial national mascot. You see puffins everywhere, um, and there's a good reason. Uh, Iceland has more puffins than anywhere else in the world. Keep in mind, puffins only come to land in the early summer, and they leave in the late summer. So if you would only see them from, let's say, early June or late May through the end of August. The Westman Islands have the largest puffin population anywhere in the world. So if you're there in the summer and you want to see puffins, this is a great place to see them. If you want to be guaranteed of seeing a puffin any time of day or night, you can stop by the aquarium at the Westman Islands. They rescued a little puffling who couldn't quite take off with the rest of his flock, and they nursed him back to health. And now he just sort of waddles around the halls of the aquarium <laughs> and gets up and close and personal with the, uh, with the tourists. Uh, it's really fun to go to the <coughs> aquarium in the Westman Islands and meet Toti the penguin, or sorry, Toti the puffin, that's his name. Um, so this is the only place in Iceland you can be guaranteed of seeing a puffin. Uh, so again, in sum, you've got four popular day trips from Reykjavik, Blue Lagoon, Golden Circle, South Coast, Westman Islands. If you have four days in Iceland, I would probably devote a day to each of those and spend your nights divided between Reykjavik and the South Coast. Mm -hmm.